looking for a reasonably priced holiday. I went to South Africa for a month last year, and I'd like to see North America this time, maybe Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, welcome to the travel depot. How can I help you? Well, I'm looking for a reasonably priced holiday. I went to South Africa for a month last year, and I'd like to see North America this time, maybe Canada. But I'm also interested in Europe if the prices to Canada are too expensive. I'm on quite a tight budget, you see. Well, you could go to Europe, but I'll get some prices for Canada first. I've been to Vancouver. It's lovely at this time of year, and we have some special offers on at the moment. Okay. Well, I have some relatives over in Vancouver, so that would be good. I can always travel around Europe next year. Besides, it may be a bit too hot for me at this time. Right. Let's have a look at some prices then. When would you like to go? Some time at the end of next month, if possible. But I'm quite flexible any time between the twenty-fourth and the thirty-first. I'd like to go for three weeks. Well, there's lots of availability for those dates. Now, if you're concerned about the cost, it's cheaper if you don't mind not flying direct. Sorry, what do you mean? Well, if you don't mind changing planes, then it's cheaper. Oh, well, I don't mind changing planes. In that case, the cheapest flight I have leaves on the twenty-fifth and changes in New York. It's only a short stop. You'll be in the airport for two and a half hours. How does that sound? Sounds good, but what's the price? That's four hundred and twelve pounds for a return flight, but that doesn't include airport tax. Would you like to arrange any accommodation? No, I have a cousin I can stay with. All I need is a flight, so I think I'll take that one. Right, I'll just check availability for your return. Three weeks, did you say? Yes, that's right. Okay. Well, there are seats available on the fourteenth or the fifteenth. Which one would you prefer? The fourteenth sounds good. Yes, from the twenty-fifth to the fourteenth sounds fine. I'll reserve that for you then. Can you tell me your name, please? Jim Jackson. Is that J A C K S O N? That's right. And can I take an address and contact number? Yes, it's Ten Allen Road, Oldham. Do you want a home number or my mobile? Either's fine. Well, my home number is o one five one four three 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 nine eight. Okay, so you're booked on flight number VN two one seven to Vancouver, leaving London Heathrow at eleven thirty five in the morning on the twenty fifth, and returning on the fourteenth. So that's twenty nights. Now, one more thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Now one more thing: Do you have any travel insurance? We recommend all our clients take out some kind of cover, even though most people don't end up needing it. Most people have it just for peace of mind. Well, what type of cover do you have? There are two choices: the gold star and the silver star. Our most comprehensive cover is the gold star, which will cost twenty-one pounds for the period you are away. It's a good policy because it covers almost all eventualities, even extreme sports such as snowboarding and skydiving. Hmm. What about the Silver Star? That's eighteen pounds, but it doesn't cover you for any dangerous sports. Well, for three pounds, I think I'll take the first one, the gold cover, please. Right. And is there anything else I can help you with? Well, do you have any information about what to do in Vancouver? Yes, I'm sure there's something on the computer that can help. Ah,、uh, yes. There's a Shakespeare play at the theatre, but at fifty-four dollars, it's quite expensive. That starts at eight p.m. The City Museum is really popular too, if you like that kind of thing. They have a special exhibition of Japanese armour next month, 
Entrance is free and the museum is open from 9 to 4.30, Monday to Saturday. Would you be interested in either of those? Oh, well, uh, maybe. Well, I'm sure you can arrange that when you get there anyway. So it's the flight and the Gold Star insurance. That's £433 in total. Can I pay by visa? Yes, of course. If you start... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them.
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a tutor and a student discussing transport. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, John, come in. How's the paper going? Morning, Mr. Taylor. Pretty well, actually. Good, good. It's not all about bicycles, is it? I know you've got a thing about bicycles. Yes, but that's just... There are other ways to get around town, you know. Yes, I know. And I think I've researched pretty well all of them. Right then. So your paper's about urban transport in London, eh? Not just London, but that is going to be the focus. I've also looked at urban transport systems in cities around the world. Madrid, Beijing, Mexico City, Amsterdam, Paris, other countries too. You have been busy, haven't you? What's the purpose of your study? Well, two things, really. I want to see if there are more efficient ways of organizing urban transport systems while cutting down on traffic congestion and, of course, pollution. 
and to find ways of encouraging people to use public transport instead of their cars. Let's start with that then, with cars. I think you have a hard time thinking of ways to persuade people to swap their cars for a crowded bus or underground train. They're convenient, comfortable, faster, and sometimes they're a status symbol too. Okay, I agree that cars will probably always be the most popular means of transport, but there are ways to cut down the number of people who bring their cars into the city. It's a problem that affects every big city, and several methods have been tried. I know, I know, as I've found to my cost. When I go into London, which I do two or three times a week, I have to pay five pounds to get into the city center. Has your research thrown up any more places where they do this? Oh, yes. Apart from London, there's Oslo, Stockholm, Singapore. Now, there, in Singapore, they've got it really organized. They've imposed a tax on all roads leading into the city center, and they have electronic sensors that identify each car and then debit a credit card belonging to the owner. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And other cities, instead of charging motorists to come into the city center, have tried other measures. Such as? Well, in Athens, cars are only allowed to go into the city center on alternate days, depending on their license plate number. In Bogota and some other Latin American cities, such as Quinto and Sao Paulo, they've developed what is called a BRT system. A what? A BRT system, a bus rapid transit system. People leave their cars outside the city and take buses, which have special express lanes into and through the city. It's been so successful that they're trying it out in Mexico City, Beijing, Seoul, and Taipei and other cities are pedestrianizing more and more areas of the city center. I see. How have these measures affected traffic congestion and pollution levels? In most cases, it has led to a reduction in the number of cars entering the city center. Certainly in Singapore, where it's now much easier to move around the city and the air is much cleaner than most other cities in that part of the world. London, too, I believe. I can give some facts and figures if you like. Please do. In the first year after the tax was introduced, the number of people using buses to get to the city center rose by 38%. Really? 38%? Incredible. Yes, and the number of cars entering central London dropped by about 18%. There's more. The number of people using bicycles and mopeds went up 17%. I knew we'd get to bicycles at some point. Well, yes. In the city, the bicycle has a lot going for it. You can avoid traffic jams. There are no parking problems. They don't pollute. They're cheap to run. And they don't cost very much. Oh, and here's another fact for you. You can fit 20 bicycles in the space needed to park one car. Well, I never. But I can't see it catching on. Besides, we seem to be getting off the point. Not at all. China, Japan, and Holland have all integrated bicycles into their urban transport systems. In Holland and Japan, they've got special parking areas for commuters who get to the station by bike, and Japan has even built multi-story parking facilities for bikes close to railway stations. Then look at America. In New York, delivery services use bicycles because they can deliver messages and small parcels 
far more quickly and at much lower cost than cars or vans. Even the police use bicycles. In fact, in about 80% of the towns in America where the population is around half a million, the police regularly patrol on bicycles. And they have proved to be effective because they can reach the scene of an accident or crime faster and more quietly than officers in patrol cars, making a lot more arrests per officer. Well, you do know your bicycles, don't you? But I do need to hear more about the public transport system and what's to be done about that. And I'd like you to look a bit more into the economics of it, how much it will cost to improve the situation, and so on. Okay? Right. See you next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Bye, Mr. Taylor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the introduction about Tower Bridge and complete the summary. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tower Bridge is located in one of the most interesting parts of London. On either top of the tower, you can get a bird's eye view of the wonderful scenery all round Tower Bridge. On its south side are many tall old buildings. On its north side stands the Tower of London itself. But Tower Bridge, the first bridge over the Thames, as you travel to London from the sea, is the most famous of them all. Although they look the same age, the tower is almost a thousand years old, and Tower Bridge, which was built in the 1890s, is just over 100. Because of the tall ships up and down the Thames, it was proposed in 1850 that a bridge across the Thames near the tower was most necessary. However, the designers argued about the new bridge for about 30 years. They took so long because they had two big problems. One is that the new bridge must look like the old tower, and the other is that the bridge must not look like a modern bridge. They made it look like the old tower, so everyone was happy. Besides, the most surprising thing about Tower Bridge is that it opens in the middle while big ships are going through to the Pool of London. If you're lucky enough to see the bridge with its two opening arms high in the air, you'll never forget it. The bridge took eight years to build and cost £900,000, a lot of money in those days. But it was a wonderful success and became a famous tourist attraction in London on the day when the bridge was completed. A hundred years ago, the Thames was once London's busiest traffic route, so that the bridge opened at least 12 times a day. Today, big ships don't go so far up the Thames. Tower Bridge opens perhaps only twice a week but the same wonderful machinery is still in good condition. Green, yellow and red, the colourful wheels and engines look smart and new, not a hundred years old. They still lift the two heavy opening arms, 
each 1,000 tons, leaving 70 meters for the ships to go through. And they still can open and close the bridge in one and a half minutes. Things are changing greatly now at Tower Bridge. The horses that used to help with pulling have gone, and so have the tugs, for they are no longer necessary. The walkways from one tower to the other at the top of the bridge were closed years ago because so many people jumped off them into the Thames, which is said to open again soon. In addition, the beautiful wheels will be part of a special exhibition for the public to visit. There'll be a restaurant in one of the towers and a pub in the other. But whatever happens in its exciting future, Tower Bridge will always mean London. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.